Well, sir, the evening meal has been over only a little while, as our scene opens now. And here in the, of the living room of the small house, halfway up in the next block, we find all our friends assembled. Mr. and Mrs. Victor Gook are seated side by side in the Davenport with sections of the newspaper. But they aren't reading at the moment, being requested by their small son to listen to a thrilling passage from our third Lieutenant Clinton Stanley story. The handsome young officer regarded the band of counterfeiting, coffee ground fortune tellers with the utmost contempt. You are nothing but a band of counterfeiting, coffee ground fortune tellers, he taunted, and he threw a protecting arm around Lady Margaret. The beautiful woman coquettishly extricated herself from his affectionate grasp and trotted off a few paces. I love you, sang out Sir Lieutenant Stanley. I love you too, caroled his sweetheart. And even the heart of the scoundrelly band of counter... I don't believe I want to hear anymore. Me neither. Okay. Sir Lieutenant Stanley's a half -wit. So is Lady Margaret. Okay, people. Uh... We got anything on the docket particularly tomorrow evening, Kitty? Tomorrow evening? That's what I know of. Why? Why? Oh, this Wendy. What's this now? It ain't a belly with Wendy. Somebody's coming here? Well, maybe if it's okay with you. Who's coming? Perhaps somebody nice. Perhaps someone you like. Uh-huh. I can tell by the way you're acting it's someone I like. Oh, what's the discussion, people? Malto is my book. Old third lieutenant put the kibosh on the counter pities, did he? Seen to it that every last one of them got their just desserts. Ice cream and cake apple. <laughs> Beg pardon? You said the counterfeiters got their just desserts. I hope the desserts were ice cream and cake. <laughs> oh, I know it's not much of a joke. What's the discussion? Yes, what is it? Who's fixing us tomorrow night? Robert and Robert Haynes from Hoopston, Illinois? Nope. Why Why Flirts from Nebraska? Nope. Well, who? It's somebody like that. Here's the gift. Alf Mushikin. You're getting warm. You're getting warm. Why, I, I, why, Steber? Who's the third in remaining barber at the Butterhouse Hotel Barbershop? Stacy Alf, huh? He's coming. Well, we got nobody else coming, have we? We got no plans for tomorrow night. What's Stacy Alf coming for? Stacy. Do you remember last week, Stacy all of a sudden turning from right-handed to left-handed? No. Well, sure you do. It was the afternoon we were going to clean the attic, and I was writing a special magazine article. All but... right, I remember. What about it? Say, during the time that has elapsed, since Stacy Yop suddenly turned from right-handed to left-handed, the phenomenon has repeated itself no less than 60 or 70 times. He went back to right-handed again? He went back to right-handed and then back to left-handed, and then back to right-handed and back to left-handed. And so on and so forth and so on and so forth until it's enough to make a person's head swim. Can he change himself into a right-handed fella or a left-handed fella whenever he feels like changing? No, he can't. The switch from right-handed to left-handed is sudden, involuntary, and unexpected. He may be right-handed fella at breakfast and then turn into a left-handed fella along about noon. It's most baffling. Science tells this kiddo that people are right-handed or left-handed depending on the whereabouts in their skull of their medulla and their oblongata are located. So you explained that the other day. Oh, did I? Yeah. Did you understand it? Sure. If your medulla is on the right side of your skull and your oblongata on the left side of your skull, you'll be right-handed. The medulla and oblongata, of course, are the parts of the human brain. Whee! Three parts. Nothing. What's the op coming here for? I'm getting around to that. Good. The converse of what I've just described naturally is true. If a person's medulla is situated on the left side of their skull and their oblongata on the right side I of their skull... I know all about that. Are you sure you do? What's the op coming here for? Well, I'll tell you. Good. Dr. Fowler Lee Sacker, a distinguished Montana physician, surgeon, lecturer, and brain specialist, arrives in the city tomorrow. That's so? Dr. Socker is to deliver a talk at the Butler House Hotel addressing the members of the Better Business Friends Club. Yeah, I read about that in the paper. Sure. These days, Rush read about it in the paper. Congratulations, Rush. Oh, I read stuff in the paper. This particular item... I'm I still know. curious about good old right-handed Stacy and why he's visiting us tomorrow night. You can't put two and two together? No. Stacy wishes to consult with Dr. Socker. Oh, in all probability, Dr. Sockers will have sound theories about Stacy's astounding condition. He may be able to put his finger on the reason for Stacy's being right-handed one minute and left-handed the next. Since Dr. Sockers is coming too, then? Yes, and we may well be proud to admit him to our home. 
He's a famous Montana physician, lecturer, surgeon, teacher, brain specialist, and polo player. The four of us can get up a game of polo. <laughs> Five of us. I'll be on deck. You are witty, right? <laughs> Not me. Mom's the witty one. If Stacy out feels like he ought to see a doctor, why don't he go see a doctor? Why did he drag the doctor here? Stacy Yapstade is a candidate for membership in the lodge, and I may add, a very good friend. That's all fine and wonderful. But I still want to ask my question. Why did he drag the doctor here? If I felt like I ought to consult the doctor, I'd go consult the doctor. I wouldn't tell the doctor to meet me at Ruthie Stembottom's house or someplace. You don't catch on why I've invited Stacy to bring Dr. Sockers here? Uh-uh. You might if you thought a moment. Uh-uh. I got a halfway idea, Gov. A humorous one, no doubt. No, on the level. What is your halfway idea? Well, this Dr. Sockers is traveling around the country and naturally has no office in town. You can't go consult a doctor in his office if he's got no office. Good, Rush. Good. That's an unwritten law. Fine, clear thinking. Oh, nothing wonderful. You see, Saint? Not particularly. I can see why Stacy don't visit the doctor at his office. The doctor have a no office. But why don't the doctor visit Stacy? You can puzzle out the answer to that question, Stacy. I don't believe I'll bother. Stacy resides in the Bright Kentucky Hotel. Well? Don't you grasp the point? Uh Uh-oh. I bet you do, Rich. No, I don't. Not this trip. The Bright Kentucky Hotel is no place to consult a doctor. Why Why not? The noise. Freight trains, passenger trains, work trains, and switch engines roar past there every minute of the day and night. The furniture rattles, and the air is full of smoke, and cinders constantly pound against the window pane and everything else. Dr. Suckers wouldn't be able to hear himself think. No, the Bright Kentucky Hotel is no place to consult a physician. Why, if Dr. Suckers attempted to take Stacy's temperature, the, the thermometer would shoot right out of his mouth from the vibration. Huh. Yeah. Isn't that true, Harry? <laughs> yeah, I guess it is at that. And Stacy's room is on the railroad track side of the building to boot, isn't it? Yes. It's impossible to carry on a conversation in a room that's on the railroad track side of the Bright Kentucky Hotel. Everybody has to yell their head off, and then you can't understand each other. It would be beneath the dignity of a distinguished man like Dr. Fowler V. Sockers to yell his head off. Yeah, I guess so. So now you have the picture in clear perspective, Stacy. In order for Stacy Yop to consult with this famous physician, a meeting place must be provided. As Stacy Yop's good friend and well-wisher, I have offered my home as the meeting place. I'm sure you can have no real objection. <laughs> Besides doing Stacy a good turn, I also have a scientific interest in the matter. This predicament is baffling and bewildering. I'm anxious to hear Dr. Sucker's diagnosis. What is it exactly that ails him, Stacy? One minute he's right-handed, the next minute he's left-handed. Precisely. Well, that don't sound so terrible serious to me. I bet you'd find it upsetting. Not if I felt all right other ways. The thing of it is, Dave, if your medulla is located on the right side of your skull and your oblongata is located on the left side of your skull, we may safely assume that you are... Left-handed. Right-handed. All right, right-handed. Don't go into that oblongata trash anymore. What is there in particular about this business that bothers Stacy? Well, take today. Yeah. Normally right-handed... Stacy found himself at the breakfast table this morning holding his spoon in his left hand. Did that scare him? Well, it didn't exactly scare him, but it made him wonder if his medulla had switched places with his oblongata during the night to where his medulla had somehow worked its way over to the left side. All of right, him. go on with your story. And as I say, he found himself holding his spoon in his left hand. Uh-huh. Two hours later, while at work in the Butler House Hotel barber shop. He was shaving a client and was astounded and agitated to notice that he was holding the razor in his right hand. Oh. He'd gone back to right-handed in the short space of two hours. Oh, hey, Gov, I bet he's just like Vernon Pagel. In what way? In baseball, Vernon bats either left-handed or right-handed, just as he decides. Also, he can throw right-handed or left-handed. The scientific term for that rush is ambidextrous. Is it? Your chum, Vernon Pagels, is ambidextrous. Your chum, Stacy Yop, is ambidextrous. Not at all. No? Not at all. Shall I tell you why? Okay. During moments when Stacy Yop is right-handed, his spoon or his fork or his razor or whatever he's holding feels awkward and unwieldy in his left hand. During moments when he's left-handed, articles in his right hand feel awkward and unwieldy. Uh-huh. Do you see? Uh-huh. And here is the clincher. Mm-hmm. This morning, at breakfast, Stacy found himself holding his spoon in his left hand. 
At dinner this noon, he found himself holding his spoon in his right hand. And at supper tonight, yes, he found himself holding his spoon. Yes, in either hand. He had two spoons? He had two spoons. He was eating with both hands? He was eating with both hands. My goodness. Stacy Yop was left-handed and right-handed all at the same time. Gee whiz. Yes, gee whiz. Do you wonder he wishes to consult Dr. Fowler V. Suckers? Oh, goodness sake. What is it, Stacy? Uh, nothing. Well, neighbors, so ends today's visit at the small house halfway up in the next block. But seems like something's always going on at the residence of Mr. and Mrs. Victor Cook. And I'll be waiting there to open the door for you when you drop in on vacant stay the next time. This is Ed Hurley. He's speaking. Well, sir, it's early evening as we approach the small house halfway up in the next block now. And here on the front porch, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Cook, their son, Mr. Rush Cook, and Sage's amiable Uncle Fletcher. Uncle Fletcher has the floor at the moment, and we hear him describing his recent visit in Dixon. We had wonderful traveling weather all the way there. I mean, by wonderful traveling weather, the sun was behind a cloud all the time. I don't like riding on a train when it's sunshiny outdoors. Too much glare. The conductor was a fellow going under the name of Cunningham. He punched my ticket right off the bat. Did you give him something to eat? How's that, Sadie? It was me talking, Uncle Fletcher. Fine. Yes, I've made that a lifelong practice throughout my years of traveling around the country. I invariably slip the conductor on the train something to nibble on. Puts him in a good humor every time. An orange or a banana or a coconut cookie will fetch any conductor on the line. He'll stand by your seat and chat with you. Conductors, as a general rule, scoot up and down the aisle in a big hurry... But offer him some little dainty that caters to his sweet tooth, and he'll give you all the railroad statistics and information you want, and even let you wear his cap. You must remember that when you go on your inspection tour next month. Yeah, I will. The conductor on the train coming home was a fellow under the name of McClellan. First rate fellow. He punched my ticket without an instant's hesitation. Uh huh. Come along the aisle and punch my ticket without an instant's hesitation. What'd you give him to nibble on? I give him a chocolate cupcake, Sadie. Oh. Son of a gun wasn't going to take it at first. I'm on duty, he says, but I egged him into it. Finally, he ate that cupcake and half of another one. <laughs> oh, it'll work out every trip. Just slip the conductor some little dainty that caters to his sweet tooth, and you'll forget he's in a hurry and stand by your chair and tell you whether the train's on time or not, or anything else you want to know. <laughs> sure. Did you see lots of old friends in Dixon, Uncle Fletcher? Yes. I saw Cooney Miller, Art Sykes, Bert Adams, Cliff Dirtshirt, and his brother Charlie. Whole outfit. Cliff Dirtshirt, by the way, say he is leaving Dixon the 1st of October. Oh, is he? You know Cliff pretty well, I expect. <laughs> no, to tell the actual truth, I don't know him at all. <laughs> he asked about you folks, too. Nice of him. Cliff Dirtshirt is moving to Baltimore, Delaware, the 1st of October. Oh, when he gets to Baltimore, Delaware, he plans on marrying a woman 31 years old, going into the live bait business and taking in piano pupils as a sideline. Ever hear Cliff Dirt Shirt clip off a selection of the piano, Sadie? No, I never did. The interesting thing how Cliff got started on the piano. Cooney Muller let the cat off the bike. It's supposed to be a big secret how Cliff got started on the piano. But Cooney Muller slipped me the information on the slide. Smelly <laughs> <laughs> so Clark's Uncle Strap can reduce himself to a squirming hulk of convulsive laughter by remembering the time... Oh, Uncle Fletcher is huh? telling something, Rush. Oh. It's rich how Cliff Dirtshirt got started on the play of it. <laughs> well, let us in on it. Well, late in the fall of 1932, Cliff was working there on the railroad section gang and had come up with early snow. Well, that was all right. Cliff never gave it a second thought but went right ahead on driving Spike. But the straw boss, a fellow going under the name of Davidson, lost his temper. Lost his temper because it snowed? No, Vic. The way did he lose his temper? That's right, Vic. I'm at a loss. Well, let him tell what he's telling. This uh, straw boss, Davidson, said he has got a grown-up daughter now. Oh? I was introduced to her in Dixon. Dorothy, her name is. Very nice young lady. 
They're giving her around town. She's going to marry a fellow 24 years old soon. Uh-huh. Well, you take grown-up daughters that way. They'll meet some fellow 24 years old and get married. Yes. Every time. Oh, how this railroad section gang pal of yours happened to start on the piano, Uncle Fletcher? Well, sir, it all of a sudden come up this snowstorm. See that? Yeah, and the straw boss got mad. That's correct. You in on the secret? Uh, no. Cooney Muller tells me there's only three or four people in the whole city of Dixon that know why Cliff Dirt Church started on the piano. Well, why did he? <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> Don't be impatient. No, but after exciting the guy's curiosity, the fingers oh, to leave Cliff him up Dirt in Church the... started on the piano. Just because his cousin married a woman 16 and a half years old. Is that the reason? Yes. His cousin married a woman 16 and a half years old, so he started on the piano? Yes. <laughs> Where did the snowstorm come in at? You get the point, Rush. I'm not real sure I do. Uh, Cliffer and the rest of the section gang were all standing there on the railroad tracks driving spikes. It come up to sudden snow. Davidson, the straw boss, lost his temper. He turned to Lafe Montgomery, the water boy, and says... Sadie, Lafe Montgomery lives in Des Moines, Kansas now. Oh. I bet he married a woman 22 years old. He moved to Des Moines, Kansas a year ago last April and married a woman 22 years old. <laughs> hey, good going, girl. I get the nail right on there. Yeah. I got a second sight, kiddo. I'm a fortune teller. I'm a mind reader. Yeah, you're terrible smart. Mm. Uh, married a woman 22 years old, did he, Uncle Fletcher? Married a woman 22 years old, went into the non-removable varnish business, and has just lately wrote back to his friends in Dixon as he's working on an invention to keep lawnmowers from getting clogged up with wet grass in rainy weather. Uh-huh. Little late Montgomery. He was just a lad when I knew him. Uh-huh. Yep. I, uh, suppose you chatted with old Mr. Cunningham. Brought some junk home with me from Dixon, Sadie. Oh, really? Different trash I'd left there at different people's houses. Uh-huh. Keepsakes and mementos for the most part. Nothing of any value. Thought I'd divide it up between you and Bessie. Uh-oh. Here's where you get 14 velvet-covered paving bricks. Uh-huh. I brought back a leather sofa cushion, for one thing. Uh, leather sofa cushion? Leather sofa cushion filled with genuine Missouri sand. Sand? Genuine Missouri sand. Sand that was gathered from the banks of the Mississippi River near Hannibal. Sofa cushion will heft close to 60 pounds. Did you take that on the train with you? Yes. Well, holy smoke, wasn't it heavy? Cooney Muller helped me load it. Who helped you unload it? Yes. <laughs> that kind of an embarrassing thing to happen with that leather sofa cushion. I left it out in the aisle beside my seat, see, and the conductor come along and stumbled over it, like to broke his neck. That's the main reason why he was sulky and wouldn't take the chocolate cupcake off of him right at first. He was all for punching my ticket and to heck with me. But I wheedled him into eating his cupcake, and in five minutes he was happy as a lark. Mm. Well, uh, what else did you bring back from Dixon, Uncle Fletcher? A leather sofa cushion filled with genuine Missouri sand direct from the banks of the Mississippi River near Hannibal. Well, I mean, besides that. I brought back a leather dresser scarf with writing burned on it. Oh? The big catfish are biting in the sloughs behind La Crosse, Wisconsin, Uncle Ted. Is that what's written on the dresser scarf? Yes. Hmm. You can have it, or Bessie can have it. Bessie can have it. Also, I brought back a horsehair watch fob. Thought you could use that brush. Thanks. Of course, I got no watch. Cliff Dirtshirt made that horsehair watch fob. Oh, isn't he the one that started on the piano? Yes. <laughs> it's the limit how Cliff started on the piano. <laughs> but just because a complete stranger stopped him on the street and tried to sell him a pair of tennis shoes. Is that the reason he started on the piano? Yes. How about the snowstorm? And how about his cousin that married the woman 16 and a half years old? Why... Let's forget about old Cliff and his piano. Yes. What um, else did you bring back from Dixon, Uncle Fletcher? Saw them all. Saw Cooney, Muller, Art Sykes, Bert Adams, Cliff Dirtshirt, and his brother Charlie. They have a whole outfit. Mm -hmm. Well, take it all around, then you had a real good time, hmm? Had a first-rate time. <laughs> That's good. I told everybody hello for you folks. Uh-huh. Stayed and quiet, don't you know? Sure. How's Vic? How's Sadie? How's Rug? Uh-huh. They inquired. Uh -huh. But the best part of the visit was hearing that secret about old Cliff. He started on the piano. Started on the piano, yes. Uncle Fletcher. Yes? Why did Cliff start on the piano? 
Cliff Dirtshirt started on the piano just because he read it in the newspaper. Where a fellow living in Philadelphia, Ohio, took an automobile apart with a hairpin. Get ready to smile again with radio's home folks, Vic and Sade, written by Paul Reimer. Yes, so here again, folks, your good friends, Vic and Sade, brought to you by the makers of Crisco. Well, it's early evening. We enter the small house halfway up in the next block now, and here in the living room we find Mr. Rushbrook all by himself. The young man is stretched out on the Davenport, absorbedly following the adventures of his favorite fiction hero, Third Lieutenant Clinton Stanley. But at this moment, having become aware of sounds in the kitchen, he calls inquiringly. Hi. Evening, Freddy. All along, Uncle Fletcher. Am I in the living room? Oh, yes, please, Yeah, I guess it is. Who spent the space brain before morning, though? Uh-huh. Well, Captain Luther Stembaum come along Kelsey Street just now. My guess they're on their way to the picture show. I jolly good. Ted, I said, what kind of... Just you hear us? <laughs> That's all. I thought I was talking to Sadie all the time. Come on, Nick Joy calling on Miss Anu. Oh? I wouldn't be surprised at what they're sitting out on the front porch. Like to stroll over? No, I won't horn in. What do you got in the box? Yes, no, I won't horn in. They take women that way. They like to visit between themselves. I won't horn in. What do you got in the box, Uncle Fletcher? Watch rags. Oh? Property of my land by Miss Keller. Oh? I brought them over to show your mother. She's interested in wash rags. Yes, yeah, she is. I wouldn't be surprised but what this particular collection of wash rags is one of the finest in the country. Huh. My landlady and Miss Keller has been accumulating wash rags many years. She owns several thousand of them. This is the pick of the lot. Well, why don't you take them next door? I got on the subject of wash rags at the supper table this evening. I was putting myself a toothpick out of a match. Something in my tooth, understand? Uh-huh. Miss Keller got to talking about her collection of wash rags. Oh, I asked several remarks on the subject. Uh-huh. By this time, I fixed my tooth. What was in your tooth? Piece of meat. Oh, uh-huh. I got this piece of meat out from my tooth, don't you see? And I snapped my jackknife shut, and I said, Miss Keller, why don't you let me take some of your wash rags over and show them to my niece? She's a bug on wash rags, too. Yeah, she sure is. So, that's what I got in this box. Well, look, let's go next door and let Miss Dino and my... Oh, I can guess I won't turn in rush. I know they get a kick out of seeing the wash rag. I won't horn in rush. You take ladies that way. They like to visit between themselves. Uh-huh. Tell you what I will do, though. Okay. I'll show you the wash rag. All right. I'll give you the interesting facts and figures. Then when Sadie comes home, you can pass them along to her. Fine. I'm going downtown to the courthouse yard anyway, directly. Once of them are probably sitting on the concrete and back ones talking. Uh-huh. Tank that stuff. Why, I like skeever. Michigan, Michigan, from Michigan, Michigan, such scally here. Yeah, they generally are down in the courthouse yard, even. I can hear some mighty wise opinions expressed in the courthouse yard. <laughs> yeah. All right, Rush. <clears throat> now for the wash rack. Okay. This is one of the finest collections in the country. Oh. I'll give you the interesting facts and figures, and you can pass them along to Sadie when she comes home. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. this first wash rag. Uh huh. This first wash rag is made out of genuine chamois skin. My landlady, Miss Color, planted the chamois bush right in her own garden and picked the fruit when it was ripe. The fruit? Yes. A chamois isn't a fruit. Chamois is an animal. 
Sammy's a kind of like a deer. 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 Antelope. Well, that's a different kind of a shack. <laughs> this chamois skin grew in a bush, and this color planted it herself. Hmm. Water it every day, kept it well pruned and weeded. But when the fruit got ripe, she harvested it and made this high class wash rag. <laughs> Think you can remember these interesting facts and figures, Russ? I know good and well I can remember all you told me about that chamois skin wash rag. Right. Now, second wash rag. The second wash rag. Oh. This wash rag. Uh, I haven't got my glasses, Rush. What's it say on here? Uh, knitted to the memory of Raymond Belcher Beerman, who expired from having a 10,000-ton railroad bridge fall on him December 19, 1887. Yes. Who was Raymond Belcher Beerman? That, Rush, I don't know. Miss Keller know? No. Miss Keller found this wash rag on a streetcar in Rockford, Illinois, many years ago. It's a peculiar kind of a memorial for a person that's passed away. Brings a tear to your eye, does it? <laughs> no. If it brings a tear to your eye, here's a wash rag to wipe the tear off with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just jolly you. Uh, Don't take anything I say too serious. I joke back for a good year. Sure you weren't joking about that chamois skin bush? How's that? Nothing. I see the next wash rag that printed on it, too. Uh, yes. Can you make out what it says? Uh... Eastern, Western, Joliet, and Southern Railroad. Please put this back on the rack. Miss Keller never mentioned where she got that wash rag. Mm. Very close mouth on the subject. Mm. So I can't give you any interesting facts and figures. Mm. Now, here. Uh-huh. Wash rag with pockets in it. <laughs> Five separate pockets in this wash rag with labels on the flaps. Tell her what they're for. Read the labels once. Bills, change, keys, tobacco, insurance policy. Ever see a wash rag like this one before? No, I never did. It was invented by Caldwell Klein in Buffalo, New Jersey during the Spanish-American War. You may have heard of Caldwell Klein in connection with his thought of being able to light his cigar by rubbing his feet together. No, I never heard of him. Fine. Wash rags with pocket in it. Huh? Now, this wash rag... It's also got print on it. Yes. Property of the Terre Haute, Centralia, Gillespie, and Southern Illinois Electric Line. When through using, kindly give to porters. Miss Cotter never given any statistics about that particular wash rag. Mm. I don't know how she come by it. Mm. This next one, Rush, is very interesting. Uh-huh. Notice what's embroidered on it? George. George is right. I turned <clears throat> the wash rag inside out. Uh-huh. What do you see now? Edna. Edna's correct. I suppose the, the idea... The idea is that it can be used by both the husband and the wife. George uses it, see? Uh-huh. And then Edna turns it inside out and uses it. And then Edna turns it inside out and uses it. <laughs> the George and Edna referred to on the wash rag were George and Edna Gaff Beetle. But just so happens I knew them because they were originally Dixon people. Lived in Dixon long about 1905 or 6. Then they moved either to Boston, Connecticut to Little Rock, Oklahoma, I forget which. Uh-huh. George and Edna. Here's another railroad wash rag. Oh, Property of the Chicago, Downers Grove, Sycamore, and Skulking Indian diesel-powered shuttle system. Tossed in wicker basket after using. I don't recall any such figures on that. Hmm. Now here, Rush, we have what I believe is the most interesting wash rag in the entire collection. Oh? It is a wash rag. Yes? It is a wash rag that turned to stone. <laughs> really? Very likely it's the only one in existence. I wouldn't be surprised. A wash rag that turned to stone by George. Mm. Drop it on the library table once. Okay. You can tell the scholars up at high school about that wash rag. Yeah. Go ahead. We will go. So, huh? Yeah. This scholar tells me she asked the fellow in a jewelry store to estimate how old this wash rag is, and he refused to even take a shot at death. Take it on outdoors, man, he says. <laughs> this next one was a birthday present to somebody. I'm going to wish I had my glasses. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, to Uncle Albert Boker on his 97th birthday, we love you. Martha, Harry, Chuck, David, William, Cecil, Irving, and Roger. I'm not familiar with those people. Oh. Relations in this color is like. Oh. This next wash rag is almost as interesting as the one that turned to stone. This wash rag turned to putty. Putty? Yes. I'll just stop it on the library table. <laughs> but the wash rag turned to putty. Uh, I'll go through the rest of these quick. Yeah. Wash rag made out of heavy material for people living in cold climates. 
Wash rag made out of life material for people living in warm climates. Uh-huh. Wash rag shaped like a hyena. Uh-huh. Wash rag shaped like a vinegar bottle. Uh-huh. Well, guess that's all the wash rags. Mighty interesting collection. One of the finest collections in the country. Are you sure you don't want to step next door and show my own this Oh, no, Rush. I, I won't horn in. You take women that way, they prefer to visit between themselves. I just walk on down to courthouse yard. You tell Sadie the different Here's one more, Uncle Fletcher. Beg pardon? Here's one more wash ray. Oh? Property of the Dubuque, Quincy, Davenport, and East Moline Railroad. We want this back. Fine, fine. <laughs> concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block. And so we leave Mrs. Beach and Chris Goes Bake and Sade until the next time. Don't forget to listen. Get ready to smile again with radio's home folks, Vic and Sage, brought to you by Procter & Gamble. Oh, gosh, be a sport, Tom. Come on out to the house for dinner. Uh, No, Phil, uh, I don't think I'd better. Now, look, your wife's away, and and besides, Betty's having one of her swell lemon meringue pies. Uh, Yeah, but... And you've missed some awful good eating till you've sampled one of Betty's pies. (laughs) What pie crust she makes. It's that flaky golden brown kind... And tender? Oh, boy. I uh, wish my wife turned out pies like that, but, you know, pie-making just throws her somehow. Say, pardon me uh, for butting in here. Uh, who are you? Oh, just a guy who knows a lot about pies. For instance, I'll bet Betty makes her swell pie crust with the new Sure Mix Crisco. Hmm? Yes, she does. I watched her last Sunday. Well, that's one reason it's so easy for her to turn out pie crust that's flaky and tender. Well, wh- what's this, uh, what do you call it? Crisco. Yeah, yeah. What's Crisco got to do with pie crust turning out flaky and tender? Well, Sure Mix Crisco is a new and different kind of shortening. It's made by a special new process not found in any other home shortening we know of. Why, if you ever tasted a cake made with Crisco, you could see this difference yourself. Because Crisco turns out lighter cakes than any other shortening. And it's easy to turn out wonderful pie crust with Crisco, too. Hmm. You mean if I got some Crisco for my wife, she could turn out flaky tender pie crust, too? Sure. This new Crisco is is so much creamier, and it cuts into flour so easily that... Why, it's a cinch to make wonderful pie crust. No kidding. Sure. And and listen to this. Crisco's a pure all-vegetable shortening, so it won't give you pie crust that are strong-tasting or greasy or indigestible. Why, even the kids can safely eat pies made with Crisco, because Crisco's a digestible shortening, and many doctors call attention to that. Is that a fact? Mm Mm-hmm. Say, I gotta take home some of this Crisco. Well, because I know your wife will find it easy to turn out flaky, tender pie crusts with Sure Mix Crisco. Well, sir, it's a few minutes past seven o'clock as we enter the small house halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Gook settling themselves for a quiet evening at home. Our friends are occupied with sections of the newspaper, and for some time, no words have been exchanged. But now, a voice from the dining room is heard. Listen. Hey, guys, since when has Government South Carolina been the geographic center of the United States? What does the lad say? Hmm. What do you say, lad? Since when has Dallas, South Carolina been the geographic center of the United States? You're not monkeying around by buffet drawers out there, are you? No. I'm looking at this letter on top of the buffet where it's got a letter in it that says Dallas, South Carolina is the geographic oh, center of the United States. Oh, golly, you did States. get mail, so, so the yeah. Missouri was Bring it in, Willie. What? Bring Gov's letter 
you're in here. I asked you if I got any mail. Yes, I know you did. But you asked me right at the very minute Rush went to work and dropped my olive and pickle shoe on the floor and broke it. I was so vexed and upset, I couldn't think about anything else. All right, George, if Gravelman, South Carolina is the geographic center of the United States, I don't want my change. I'm sorry, Dick. Mm. I was so disgusted with Rush's carelessness. I've had that cut glass olive and pickle shoe since I've been married. Maybe it can be fixed, Mom. I was examining the various broken fragments, and I bet a little mucilage. No, it wouldn't either. Anyway, I threw the various broken fragments in the garbage box. I bet I think twice before I let children handle fancy cut glass dishes again. Mm. Give me my letter, Union suit. It's postmark Gravelman, South Carolina. H.K. Fleaver. Letterhead states Gravelman, South Carolina is the geographic center of the United States. Where do they get that noise? I expect you've got studying to do this evening, haven't you? No. Why not? Couldn't study if I wanted to. Never brought any books home. You never bring any books home anymore here lately. What's the reason? I'm getting by okay up at school. Just getting by is not enough. Seems to me any boy that can find time to smash his mother's lovely, expensive, cut glass olive and pickle shoe would be able to find time to improve his algebra marks. <laughs> you act like i done that on purpose, Mom. You know it was an accident. Well, you're a big trouble when your wife and dishes as your mind's 40,000 miles away. You daydream. Person's got to keep their mind on what they're doing. Oh. Uh-huh. Sure. Oh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. If Gravelman, South Carolina is the geographical center of the United States, you can build a bonfire and take my son you to answer Anderson. your cousin Yuncey's last lovely letter? Oh. Do it. Oh, my. What the heck's the use Do of... it. Got nothing else occupying your time. Uh, invited to Gravelman, South Carolina. Who was? All of us. H.K. Fleaver? Uh-huh. When? August. Hmm. H.K. and the missus say they'd like to have us come and stay two weeks. Hmm. Darn funny invitation as invitations go. <laughs> How you mean? I'll read you the letter. You people lounging around of an evening discussing pro and con, the subject of funny invitations, <laughs> might get a good hearty belly laugh out of an experienced Smelly Clark's Uncle Straphead. Don't Won't intend he? to answer, Cousin Yuncey. Hmm? Sure. Sit yourself down at the library table and get started then. Use my stylish purple ink and good stationery. Uh-huh. Some boys got plenty of time to smash their mother's lovely, valuable cut glass olive and pickle shoe, but they can't find any extra minutes to do what they're supposed to do. Oh. Sit down and get started. Oh. Want to hear what H.K. Fleaver's got to say? Yeah. Time is half with invitation to come spend two weeks I ever come across. Read the letter. <clears throat> Dear Sky Brother Gook, warm greetings from Gravelman, South Carolina. The geographic center of the United States. It's not, is it? <laughs> no. wonder what's eating, Fleaver. Hmm. Well, read the letter. Uh, dear Sky Brother Cook, warm greetings from Gravelman, South Carolina, the geographic center of the United States, in hot valorum dum cluck each, cornucopia espionage non referendum hump, sim spittle ad nauseum bolo, lazy hobo hick vippy sick. Epidermis, yokel, agricola, almas, gallia, divisis. Well, infest. how much of that is there? One or two more sentences. Oh. Epidermis, yokel, agricola, almas, gallus, divisi, in tre, party, yale, sap. Sim, sis, sit, sil, sip. Brini, huckalorum, puelis, ya. Decim, aqua, ad libris, mm. That's all the Latin joke. Mm-hmm. Well, Vic, you first snatch an old horse thief, how are things? I've been meaning to write for a long time but just didn't seem to be able to get around to it. We are all fine and feeling frisky. Hope you and the missus and little girl are well. Little girl? H.K. refuses to get it through his noodle that I've got a son and not a daughter. Well, Rush isn't a daughter's name. Uh-uh. I suppose if you told him you had an animal around the house named Fido, he'd write and ask you how your horse was feeling. How are you coming along with your letter to you, say? Wonderful. I'll examine it when you're through. Oh. Hope you and the missus and little girl are well. The wife and myself have been wondering if you folks couldn't get away in August for a two weeks visit. We'd be so glad to have you. Now, here's where it gets funny. Funny? The invitation. Hmm. Funniest invitation to come spend two weeks I ever come across. Hmm. They don't want us on consecutive days. Consecutive days? They want us to come over Wednesday and stay till Friday and then go away for a day and then come back instead. Well, here, I'll read it to you. Mm-hmm. 
Ms. Fieber and myself would like to have you arrive on Wednesday the 20th of August if convenient. Stay till Friday the 22nd and return Sunday the 24th. We'd like to have you stay from Sunday the 24th till Thursday the 28th. Return on Tuesday, September 2nd. From Tuesday, September 2nd, we'd love to entertain you to... Hey, here. Peculiar, huh? I think I can straighten you individuals out. Mr. and Ms. Fleber are desirous... They want us to come to Groveland, South Carolina, stay two days, and then go away a day, huh? Hmm, I guess so. Where'd we go? <laughs> Search me. Home? Wouldn't have time to go home. Groveland, South Carolina is clear across the continent. They ask us to leave on Friday and come back on Sunday. Couldn't be done. Why, how crazy. Uh, well, let's see. We arrive on Wednesday, go away on Friday, come back on Sunday, stay till... The uh, following Thursday. Then go away again and come back the next Tuesday. From that particular Tuesday, we were asked to visit until the following Saturday. Why, how crazy, crazy. Yeah. Adds up to a seven-day visit so far. Does it? Yeah. Uh, Wednesday to Friday is two days. Sunday to Thursday is... No, wait. Wednesday to Friday is two days. Sunday to well, Thursday is... Well, let me read the rest of the letter, and then we can figure it out. Okay. Uh, love to entertain you till Saturday, September 6th. Return to our home Thursday, September 11th, and stay in until Sunday, September 14th, would round out your two weeks' visit. Well, love all the wild, fantastic That's right. That's right. right. Makes exactly 14 days. What days? Those days. Look, you arrive on Wednesday and uh, leave on Friday. That's two days. You return on Sunday and stay till Thursday, four days more or six days. You go away till the next Tuesday and then come back and stay till Saturday. That's five more or eleven days. You go away till another time, returning on Thursday. You're invited to stay till Sunday. Thursday to Sunday is three days. Three plus eleven is fourteen or exactly two weeks. Is H.K. Flaber completely out of his head? <laughs> I don't know. Why did me leaving here in the middle of August and not getting back till the middle of September? Uh, what do we do in between times in South Carolina there? Camp out? <laughs> you so. Yes. Well, Vic, you horrible old cattle wrestler, think it over. We'd certainly like to entertain you here in government, the geographic center of the United States. Have a chat with the missus and write me what you decide. In the meantime, good luck and regards to Mrs. Cook and little Eliza. Stobo Philip in the scratching hunk. Non fubbo bum fishing poosh. Cabbage idiot at Puzzig Vunk. Bim bip bill bix. Yours fraternity, H.K. Fleaver. Well, we going? Uh uh. <laughs> I'll say uh uh. <laughs> Fish. You people skulking around the house here of an evening talking about funny invitations. <laughs> Puts me in mind of an invitation as issued by Smelly Clark's Uncle Strap to his lady friend. On an occasion when Smelly Clark's Uncle Strap took it in his How's your answer to Cousin Eunice's sweet little letter coming along? Uh, read me what you've got so far. Uh, Go ahead. Read me what you've got so far. I suppose you heard me speak. Dear Eunice. Which concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block. And here we leave, Vic and Sade, until the next time. You know, there's something about a plate of piping hot apple fritters that just seems to hit the spot on a bright Sunday morning. Can't you just see them, all crispy and golden brown, waiting to be doused with syrup? Oh, boy, they're good. And listen, if some of your folks think fried foods are indigestible, just you try frying those fritters the Crisco way. Because sure makes Crisco's a pure, all-vegetable shortening that's digestible. Many doctors call attention to that. Why, when you see how fresh and sweet this creamy white Crisco is, you'll know it won't make your fried foods heavy or greasy. I should say not. With Crisco, fried foods are crispy and golden brown and digestible. Remember, Sure Mix Crisco's the new kind of shortening that gives you lighter cakes than any other home shortening we know of. Yet Crisco's so economical, you can use it for fried foods, too. Why, Crisco costs you only a few pennies a week for all your frying. So get Crisco today. See what a wonderful difference a pure, all-vegetable shortening can make in your fried foods. And don't forget to listen to Vic and Sade the next time. This is Ed Hurley speaking. I'm glad.
looked out the window and noticed several boys and girls on the sidewalk wondering what on earth was happening. Mm. I think your Professor Weekly must have handed out Feebly. some... Feebly. Dr. Feebly. <laughs> I think your Dr. Feebly must have handed out some bum information. Why? Well, if he said iceberg floated across Illinois 20 years ago, he was about 100% wrong. Why, holy... Oh, he said so here. Did he say iceberg? Yeah, I mean, he said iceberg several times. Did he say icebergs floated across the state of Illinois? Yeah. <laughs> That's not true. No. Yes, the gentleman has been given his speech about icebergs since before you were born. Oh, my joy, they sure must have been hanging out a bunch of junk when I went to Edwards School. We were taught that you only found icebergs out in the ocean. Sure news to me that people around Joliet, Illinois have to duck and dodge to keep I them I imagine he was familiar with what he was talking about. Authority on icebergs and all. Addressed a large audience in Somerset, Kentucky, only last week. Oh. Oh, and Vic, he scared Rupert. Oh. And he'd come to a place in his speech where he beat himself on the chest and hollered. And he was looking right at Rupert. What did you say? Oh, you claim you are an intelligent person. If you are an intelligent person, I challenge you to deny this and that and the other thing. If you are an intelligent person, I beg of you with tears in my eyes that you love it all, hoobly hoobly and peach butter. He stared at him like he was hypnotized. I'm afraid he'd fall off and face the one upside the snoop. Yeah. Well, what puzzles me is how anybody could work themselves up into a tower and fury over glaciers. Huh. Puzzles me also. There's nothing controversial about glaciers. Oh, his ashes were just for show. Was his statement just for show, too? I mean... I assume the fellow was handing out facts. Oh, sure, facts by the bushel. Forty years ago, Galena, Illinois, was visited by a glacier 66 square miles an acre in the area. Forty years ago? Well, maybe he said 400. Anyway, it was fascinating to him. When he got through and sat down, everybody walked over and gave him nice compliments. Miss Elder said she listened so attentive to that she could deliver a lecture on icebergs. Mm. You know my, so much about icebergs, Willie. What do they deposit? Nothing that I know of. Huh, not that thought you were sure. <laughs> uh-huh. Icebergs deposit rocks. Oh, heck, they do. Icebergs deposit rocks and stones, and you can see them laying on the ground to this day. You mean glaciers, don't you? Icebergs, icebergs, six to one, half a dozen of others. The fellow said they were synonymous. Did he make yeah. an answer? Oh, and there's a blackboard he tried out, too. Mm. Chopped the blackboard up against his moving picture machine, flipped some chalk out of his pocket, and drew diagrams till he laid the chunk. Mm-hmm. All right, Mr. Authority on icebergs. How much of an iceberg is underneath the water and how much on top of the water? Ten percent. Sure. Uh-huh. In an iceberg, ten percent is underneath the water, ninety percent on top of the water. Right mm-hmm. away, right. Sure. sure. What did I say? You said ninety percent on top and ten percent underneath. Oh, yeah, I guess I did get it backwards. Oh. You're right. Ten percent underneath and ninety percent on top. No. Well, no. the reason an iceberg is so dangerous is ship well, I know, I know. This makes a slip of a tongue when everybody jumps on him like a kangaroo. Mm-hmm. Pretty fancy, us simple ladies, huh, Rick? Having a regular public speaker? Yes. Yeah. Be nice if we could do it often. An order every third meeting or some such arrangement. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's the money to be considered. Uh, I mean, what Dr. Phoebe charges for his lecture when he's delivering it for pay? Maybe he passes the hat. Why, George, you wouldn't get any nickels and dimes off of me. If you quoted his statement correctly, Mom, I'd say his facts are worth about a tenth of a cent apiece. This fellow's maybe twenty-five, thirty dollars, sir. Mm, possibly. Of course, the symbol club couldn't hand over him twenty-five, thirty dollars. Mm. Be nice, I'll learn about some new subjects every few weeks. See from this afternoon, I'm familiar with all the facts about icebergs. I know all there is to know about icebergs. You say two meetings from now, we had a speaker talk about well, furniture, for instance. Mm. But of course. Big enough twenty five thirty dollars for public speakers out of the question. Mm-hmm. After Doctor Phoebe finished his oration and ate some salty mess and went upstairs to lay down, Miss Cummins told us a little story on him. <laughs> what is it? Well, it seems he was on a train going somewhere to deliver his meal. He was in the smoking car and got talking with the fellow sitting next to him. He introduced the topic of icebergs into the conversation, and he led himself right into his lecture. To give this stranger the whole hour and ten minutes speech. Gestures, fish shaking, and all. Mm. And when he got through, you know what that fellow done? No. He stood up and says, Okay, Tom, you asked for it. And he hauled off and knocked Dr. Phoebe unconscious. Good. Mm-hmm. The conductor had to put poor Dr. Phoebe off at the next station and send him to the hospital in an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Now that I know all about icebergs, we have to go see what there is for supper. Mm. You'll probably have to stop at the store, Willie. All right. Well, yeah, pretty high-tone symbol club we got. As a professional public speaker. Mm. We have claimed to up raise this I challenge anyone within sound of my voice to deny that 20 years ago, an iceberg 69 square miles in area didn't visit the beautiful city of Joliet, Illinois. We find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Cook, their son, Mr. Rush Cook, and Sage's amiable Uncle Fletcher. Uncle Fletcher has the floor at the moment, and we hear him describing his recent visit in Dixon. We had wonderful traveling weather all the way there. I mean by wonderful traveling weather, the sun was behind the cloud all the time. I don't like riding on a train when it's sunshiny outdoors. Too much glare. The conductor was a fellow going under the name of Cunningham. He punched my ticket right off the bat. Did you give him something to eat? How's that, Sadie? Who is me talking, Uncle Fletcher? Fine. Yes, I have made that a lifelong practice throughout my years of traveling around the country. I invariably slip the conductor on the train something to nibble on. Puts him in a good humor every time. An orange or a banana or a coconut cookie will fetch any conductor on the line. He'll stand by your seat and chat with you. Conductors, as a general rule, scoot up and down the aisle in a big hurry. But offer him some little dainty that caters to his sweet tooth, and he'll give you all the railroad statistics and information you want, and even let you wear his cap. You must remember that when you go on your inspection tour next month. Yeah, I will. The conductor on the train coming home was a fellow under the name of McClellan. First-rate fellow. He punched my ticket without an instant's hesitation. Uh-huh. Come along the aisle, punch my ticket without an instant's hesitation. What'd you give him to nimble on? I give him a chocolate cupcake, Sadie. Oh? Son of a gun wasn't going to take it at first. I'm on duty, he says, but I egged him onto it. Finally, he ate that cupcake and half of another one. <laughs> oh, it'll work out every trip. Just slip the conductor some little dainty that caters to his sweet tooth, and you forget he's in a hurry and stand by your chair and tell you whether the train's on time or not, or anything else you want to know. <laughs> sure. Did you see lots of old friends in Dixon, Uncle Fletcher? Yes. I saw Cooney Muller, Art Sykes, Bert Adams, Cliff Dirtshirt, and his brother Charlie. Whole outfit. Cliff Dirtshirt, by the way, said he is leaving Dixon the 1st of October. Oh. Is he? You know Cliff pretty well, I expect. <laughs> no, to tell the actual truth, I don't know him at all. <laughs> he asked about you folks, too. Nice of him. Cliff Dirtshirt is moving to Baltimore, Delaware, the 1st of October. Oh. When he gets to Baltimore, Delaware, he plans on marrying a woman 31 years old, going into the live bait business, and taking in piano pupils as a sideline. Ever hear Cliff Dirtshirt whip off a selection of the piano, lady? No, I never did. The interesting thing, how Cliff got started on the piano. Cooney Muller let the cat off the bike. It's supposed to be a big secret how Cliff got started on the piano. But Cooney Muller slipped me the information on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Swilly Clark's Uncle Stratkin reduce himself to a squirming hawk of convulsive laughter by remembering the time... Oh, Uncle Fletcher is telling something, Rush. Oh. It's rich how Cliff Nurture got started on the play of it. <laughs> well, let us in on it. Well, late in the fall of 1932, Cliff was working there on the railroad section gang and had come up in early snow. Well, that was all right. Cliff never gave it a second thought, but went right ahead on driving spikes. But the straw boss, a fellow going under the name of Davidson, lost his temper. Lost his temper because it snowed? No, Vic. The way did he lose his temper? That's right, Vic. I'm at a loss. Well, let him tell what he's telling. This uh, straw boss, Davidson, said he has got a grown-up daughter now. Oh? I was introduced to her in Dixon. Dorothy, her name is. Very nice young lady. They're giving her around town. She's going to marry a fellow 24 years old soon. 
Uh-huh. Well, you take grown-up daughters that way. Well, I'll meet some thought 24 years old and get married. Yes. Every time. Oh, how this railroad section gang pal of yours happened to start on the piano, Uncle Fletcher? Well, sir, it all of a sudden come up this snowstorm. See that? Yeah, and the straw boss got mad. That's correct. You in on this secret? No. Cooney Muller tells me there's only three or four people in the whole city of Dixon that know why Cliff Dirt Church started on the piano. Well, why did he? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Don't be impatient. No, but after exciting the guy's curiosity, the fetish oh, to leave Cliff up. Dirt Church started on the piano. Just because his cousin married a woman 16 and a half years old. Is that the reason? Yes. His cousin married a woman 16 and a half years old, so he started on the piano? Yes. Where does the snowstorm come in at? You get the point, Raj. I'm not real sure I do. And Clifford and the rest of the section gang were all standing there on the railroad tracks driving spikes. It come up to sudden snow. Davidson, the straw boss, lost his temper. He turned to Lace Montgomery, the water boy, and says, Sadie, Lace Montgomery lives in Des Moines, Kansas now. Oh, but he married a woman 22 years old. He moved to Des Moines, Kansas a year ago last April and married a woman 22 years old. <laughs> oh, hey, good going, girl. I used to nail right on the head. Yeah. I got a second sight, kiddo. I'm a fortune teller. I'm a mind reader. Yeah, you're terrible smart. Mm. Uh, married a woman 22 years old, did he, Uncle Fletcher? Married a woman 22 years old, went into the non-removable varnish business, and has just lately wrote back to his friends in Dixon as he's working on an invention to keep lawnmowers from getting clogged up with wet grass and rainy weather. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Little late Montgomery. He was just a lad when I knew him. Uh-huh. Yep. I, uh, suppose you chatted with old Mr. Cunningham. Brought some junk home with me from Dixon, Sadie. Oh, really? Different trash I'd left there at different people's houses. Uh-huh. Keepsakes and mementos for the most part. Nothing of any value. Thought I'd divide it up between you and Bessie. Uh-oh. Usually you get 14 velvet-covered payment bricks. Uh-huh. I brought back a leather sofa cushion for one thing. Uh, leather sofa cushion? Leather sofa cushion filled with genuine Missouri sand. Sand? Genuine Missouri sand. Sand that was gathered from the banks of the Mississippi River near Hannibal. Sofa cushion will heft close to 60 pounds. Did you take that on the train with you? Yes. Well, holy smoke, wasn't it heavy? Cooney Muller helped me load it. Who helped you unload it? Yes. <laughs> that kind of an embarrassing thing to happen with that leather sofa cushion. I left it out in the aisle beside my seat, see? And the conductor come along and stumbled over it, like he broke his neck. That's the main reason why he was sulky and wouldn't take the chocolate cupcake off the light at first. He was all for punching my ticket and the heck with me. But I wheedled him into eating his cupcake, and in five minutes he was happy as a lark. Yeah. Well, uh, what else did you bring back from Dixon, Uncle Fletcher? A leather sofa cushion filled with genuine Missouri sand direct from the banks of the Mississippi River near Hannibal. Well, I mean, besides that. I brought back a leather dresser scarf with writing burned on it. Oh. The big catfish are biting in the sloughs behind La Crosse, Wisconsin, Uncle Ted. Is that what's written on the dresser scarf? Yes. Mm. You can have it, or Bessie can have it. Bessie can have it. Also, I brought back a horsehair watch fob. Thought you could use that brush. Thanks. Of course, I got no watch. Cliff Dirtshirt made that horsehair watch fob. Oh, isn't he the one that started on the piano? Yes. It's the limit how Cliff started on the piano. <laughs> Just because a complete stranger stopped him on the street and tried to sell him a pair of tennis shoes. Is that the reason he started on the piano? Yes. Well, how about the snowstorm? And how about his cousin that married the woman 16 and a half years old? Why? <laughs> Forget about old Cliff and his piano. Yes. What um, else did you bring back from Dixon, Uncle Fletcher? Saw them all. Saw Cooney, Muller, Art Sykes, Bert Adams, Cliff Dirtshirt, and his brother Charlie. They were a whole outfit. Mm-hmm. Well, take it all around, then you had a real good time. Hmm? Had a first-rate time. <laughs> That's good. I told everybody hello for you folks. Uh-huh. They didn't inquire, don't you know? Sure. How's Vic? How's Sadie? How's Rug? Uh-huh. 
They inquired. Uh, but the best part of the visit was hear that secret about old Cliff. He started on the piano. Started on the piano, yes. Uncle Fletcher. Yes. Why did Cliff start on the piano? <laughs> Cliff Dirtshirt started on the piano just because he read it in the newspaper where a fellow living in Philadelphia, Ohio, took an automobile apart with a hairpin. Ready to smile again with radio's home folks, They Can Save, written by Paul Wright. Yep, here again, folks. Your friends, They Can Save, brought to you by Procter & Gamble, the makers of Crisco. And with them is Mrs. Beach, your radio neighbor. Mrs. Beach has been telling me that her family gave her quite a day last Saturday. Yes, they did, friends. You see, it was my birthday, and at our house, when it's your birthday, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Well, I didn't lift my hand all day. My daughter Dissy did all the shopping, and what do you suppose my son Johnny did? Well, he made a pie, a raspberry pie. Yes, Johnny said I talked so much about Crisco's new pastry method that, well, he thought he'd try it himself, and the pie was delicious. I'm such a sugar saver now, I'd suggested his using a third of a cup of honey for the filling instead of sugar, and it worked beautifully. And then the crust was so tender and flaky. Johnny was a little surprised it turned out so well. But really, friends, it's almost a miracle the pasty success you'll have when you use pure all-vegetable Crisco and Crisco's new method. In fact, the Crisco people guarantee you tender, flaky pie crust every single time or your money back. That's right. You see, you can't buy another shortening at your store that's like Crisco. It's specially made just to give you tender, flaky pie crust. Now, isn't that reassuring to know when you're making a pie? So if you haven't already tried this new Crisco pastry method, well, I wish you would. It's printed right on the Crisco label. And remember, you'll get tender, flaky pie crust or your money back. Yes, if you aren't satisfied with your Crisco pie crust, just drop me a note on the back of a Crisco label telling me why. Address me, Mrs. Isabella Beach, care of Crisco, Cincinnati, Ohio. And the Crisco people will refund you the price of one full pound. So try making a pie this new Crisco way real soon, won't you? And let me know how you like it. And now I wonder what's going on at the book house. Well, sir, the evening meal has been over only a little while as our scene opens now. And here in the living room of the small house halfway up in the next block, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Gook. Vic is at the telephone talking earnestly with his employer, Mr. Rubish, while Sade, wearing an apron and carrying a dish towel, hovers near the library table. Yes, I believe I've got everything organized, Chief. No, I'll be there with bells on and rearing to go. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You want something? Go ahead. Finish your chair. Oh, uh, that's right, Chief. I'll have all that material in my briefcase. No, I believe I'm all set to climb on the train this minute, if necessary. <laughs> yeah. Dishes all done. Uh, oh, wait till you had washed. Sure thing, Mr. Rubin. You should have gone ahead and washed the rest of them. Uh -huh. And wiped them, too? Why not? That'd be fine divisional labor. Why, people, sure. people, please. Let your father talk on the telephone. Why is everybody lurking around like chicken hawks? Makes a guy uncomfortable, try to... Oh, uh, a big fight, Mr. Rubin. Those arrangements have all been made, Mr. Rubin. Yep. Yep. No, I think I can pretty well say that I've got a clean slate as far as the office is concerned. 
Yeah. Oh, well. Fella, don't go on a month's inspection tour every day. <laughs> okay, T. You bet. See you tomorrow. He's a me, number one old boy. He give you a compliment, Siddy. Oh, not compliments. But he's gratified with the way that I buckled down and got stuff in shape to leave on this inspection tube. Uh-huh. May I ask once again why everybody lurks around like chicken hawk? I don't know why Willie is. He's supposed to be out doing the dishes. I'm supposed to be out in the kitchen doing half the dishes. Was agreed you were to wash them and I was to wipe them. I wiped all you had washed, so naturally my part of the job come to a standstill. I couldn't hardly All right, all right, all right. Sure. Vic, in the jam jumble of accomplishing the 509 million things I had to do today, I forgot to tell you the most important thing of all. Oh? I suppose you're still excited and happy about the going away gift shower the Thimble Club ladies give you last week. They're not giving me a edit. No. Uh-huh. You are excited and happy over that shower, aren't you? Sure. Sitting down on the Davenport, huh, Rush? Well, you're sitting down on the Davenport. Such laziness. Such laziness. Why, George, search me where the laziness comes in. If you and another individual took a job digging a hole with a pick and shovel, and the other individual laid down his shovel and told you to go ahead and dig the hole by yourself, wouldn't you scream like a panther and throw your shoes over the people's bank building? This is finished with your fancy speech. Perhaps I can speak to your father. Oh. Uh-huh. Well, what about the Thimble Club ladies' gift shower, kiddo? Well, it made you glad and happy, didn't it? Threw a blast of my porter's whistle just last night. I had a drink out of my collapsible drinking cup yesterday afternoon. They are lovely presents. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Pat Vandy going away gift shower put an idea in the heads of another group of ladies. Uh, another group of ladies is going to give me a dandy going away gift shower? <laughs> no, not quite that. These ladies are all Thimble Club ladies, but they got a new notion for something nice to do for you in honor of your leaving for a whole month on your grand inspection tour. Huh? It's a see Mr. Gook off on the train celebration. Mm-hmm. Thimble Club ladies can be so sweet. Here's their present husband going out of town for a whole month, and they doctor up a going away gift shower, and that was such a success, they're encouraged to go ahead with another son. See Mr. Gook off on the train celebration. Yes. All the Thimble Club ladies be down to depot to wave goodbye at me? Oh, not all of them, I don't imagine. Hmm. Well, here's what happened. Slipped my mind up until five minutes ago. I received a telephone call early this afternoon. Hmm. It was May Brandeis. Hmm. You remember her, don't you? I believe I met her. Sure, in the lobby of the Bijo the other evening. She admired your necktie. Oh, <laughs> my necktie she admired. Was it? Well, anyway, she called up representing the little clique of ladies from way out west that belong to the Thimble Club. Uh Uh-huh. There's four of them. They all come from way out west originally, so they got that bond between them. Uh Uh-huh. May Brandeis, Barbara Bushwell, Cad Candy, and Ellen Conan. All sweet girls. Uh Well, they were so enthusiastic over the success of your going-away gift shower, they put their heads together and doctored up this new stunt. See Mr. Gukoff on the train celebration, huh? Yes. <laughs> Molly Clark's uncle Sab really loves to recall to mind the occasion when him Supposed and his ladies... Supposed to be flattered or crowd of ladies down at the railroad station waving goodbye when the conductor shouts all aboard. Hey. And throwing sawdust. Throwing sawdust? Throwing sawdust is an old western custom when you see somebody off on the train. Really? Yes. Like throwing rice at the bride and groom, Emma. Exactly. Mm, throwing sawdust at the department traveler is a favorite old western custom. Hmm. Ain't you excited about this? Yeah, yeah. You don't appear any too enthusiastic. Oh, well, I was just... Trying... You see, these four ladies, May Brandeis, Barbara Bushwell, Cad Kendi, and Ellen Conan, brought this up all by themselves. Really, it's kind of a bouquet for my lap. I'm their president, and my husband's going off out of town to be away an entire month. Okay. <laughs> what you looking so funny about? I was just reflecting on how Mr. Buller and Mr. Rubish are going to react to this demonstration. Why? Well, I am traveling in their company, see. They're both big shots and my superiors in the firm. Well? Well, they won't be startled, will they? A gang of women pelt me with sawdust and shrieking goodbye. Oh, now, hey. Well, the chief, Mr. Rubish, is a very modest, unassuming man. He hates anything on the showy side. I doubt if he'd fence his idea of getting covered with sawdust. Well, they'll be throwing the sawdust at you. Well, it sounds liable to get on him, though, ain't it? Oh, yes. I'm traveling with those big shots in rather a minor capacity stage. I'm more of a confidential secretary than anything else. 
I'm wondering if it would sit just right with Mr. Rubish. A gang of women helped me with sawdust and otherwise creating a disturbance when two of Well, if that's just... not the bullet, the choke Billy Tapps. Mr. Rubish and Mr. Buller might get the impression you just got married, Dove, and your bride is hiding in the vestibule. These lovely, lovely ladies want to pay you about as nice a compliment as a Well, I you appreciate their thoughtfulness. Don't think for a minute I don't appreciate their thoughtfulness. Why, uh, see, Mr. Gookoff on the train celebration is about as pretty a gesture as I've ever heard of. Oh, okay. But Mr. Buller and Mr. Rubish, I'm afraid they wouldn't understand... Especially Mr. Rubish. Why, he even tried to discourage a bunch of girls from the office coming down to the railroad station. Yeah? Who tasted like a horse. Are a bunch of girls from the office coming down to the railroad station? Yeah. Who are they? All of Hammersweet, Lolita de Rienzi, and Betty Walters. Oh, What are they going to throw, though? Yes, what are they going to throw? Throw. Rice, sawdust, old shoes, hard coal, or what? Yes. Well, they're not going to throw anything that I know of. Oh, I believe they have it in mind to give us a bouquet of flowers. What's the idea? Well, no idea to it. Their bosses are leaving town on an inspection tour and won't be back for a whole month. They consider it the thing to do to come down to the depot and wave goodbye. They can come down to the depot huh, and wave goodbye, but other ladies is barred. Oh, now, see. I just wanted to know, is all. Well, see, there's a difference between a few kids from the office seeing us off and a crowd of timber club ladies hurling sawdust around and acting like I was some well-known celebrity, whereas I'm just a guy more or less going along for the ride. I just wanted to know, is all. Well, I'd expect you and Rush and maybe Fred and Ruthie and Pal or so from the lodge to be on hand to see me off on my trip, but the kiddo tried to understand how I'd feel in front of my superiors if a mob of cheering women showed up with a It's all right. Perfectly all right. I understand. You know I appreciate the Slim Club thoughtfulness. Sure. Well, I'll telephone all four ladies then. I'll... Tell him not to bother accumulating any sawdust. Maybe just as well. Hmm. Oh. Well, Willie boy. Oh. How about our supper dishes? Okay. You wash and I'll wipe. Fine. Shall we walk to the kitchen? Yeah. Golly, we're doing our supper dishes late. Yeah. Don't be mad at me, kiddo. Yes, eh? Don't be mad at me. I'm not mad at anybody. I'll be leaving in just a few days. Let's not have any differences so close to the time that I'm going on my inspection tour. I'm not mad at anybody. Oh, God. Oh, God. Concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block. Well, it kind of looks like Vic's in bad, doesn't it, Mrs. Beach? <laughs> it certainly does. But maybe Sade can appease the Thimble Club ladies with this new recipe. It's for cabbage chop suey. We have it quite often in the summer. I just take some shredded cabbage, some sliced celery, pepper, and onions, and fry them very lightly in hot Crisco. And then, after they've gotten nice and brown, I cover the skillet tightly and let the chopped suey steam for about five minutes. That's all you have to do. Just put a little seasoning in, and you've really got something that tastes good. My family certainly like it. But they love all fried foods. That's why I'm so grateful Crisco is a digestible shortening. You see, you have to be careful when you have youngsters to feed. But I know Crisco is pure and all vegetable and easy to digest. Isn't it wonderful that Crisco fried foods are not only delicious, but digestible, too? And so we leave Mrs. Beach and Crisco's Vic and save until the next time. Don't forget to listen. This is Ed Roberts speaking.